episode 113. And today we're going to be talking about finding your true voice. I'm Kathleen Wiley, a Jungian psychoanalyst in North Carolina, and I am here with Deborah Henson Conant, a composer, a mentor, a creative. We both play the harp, and that's why we call this Jungian harp. And almost every week we get together with a question that we want to explore. So we come to you today not with answers, but with a question to explore together and we're on Restream, so hopefully you can join in and share your comments and be a part of the ongoing conversation, too. So, DHC, you were the one who kind of came up with this question and, and came in with it on your mind today. So, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I do want to start. I was I was talking to a friend who is is struggling um, with her voice and what her voice used to be like, what her voice is now, um, going through a transition with her voice, and just really um, also, um, you know, feeling like she might not... Um, like she like she like she didn't have a voice as a child so this this thing of voice um mm -hmm. and and i was really resonating with what she was saying because i'm st i've always been known as a harpist pretty much not always but you know certainly since i started playing the harp not before then mm -hmm. and um but i always felt that my true voice was as a composer and a performer now, of course, I've brought, no, actually, no, not a, not a performer, as a composer and as a composer of music theater, as a composer of stories with music and and words. So that's what I always felt was my true voice. And, um, and yet I was so scared to share my true voice. And I didn't know how to move forward with that, mm -hmm. that I... Um, I defaulted to the harp, which was amazing because it's given me this life of freedom and life of like a flying life. It's really mm -hmm. let me literally fly all over the world. But at the same time, I was always feeling like my true voice was not heard. So people thought they knew who I was. They'd be like, oh, isn't it wonderful? You're out there, you're playing your harp, you're doing what you want to do. And yes, and at the same time, I was like, and no, I am not speaking with my true voice, mm -hmm. which is the voice of music theater. And in specific, this one show that I've been writing my whole life. <laughs> well, now that show is about to come out. And, you know, I feel a lot of vulnerability about that, but I truly get that we are often out there in the world sharing a voice that is not necessarily who we most deeply are. And what happens sometimes when we start to share that voice, which is most truly who we are, is that it comes out as a croak. <laughs> or it comes out and that is how it is. I mean, it, that's not, there's nothing wrong, but one can feel that there is something wrong. And I see that all the time in the academy, in the Hip Harp Academy, where, where people haven't, they, they know what they want, to, or they, they have a feeling of what they want to say, but it can take some time to actually find the, um, the vocabulary. So let me, let me give you an example. Um, Danny Boy. Today is, is St. Patrick's Day. And Danny Boy is a tune that I always stayed so far away from because I heard it like, oh, oh, Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. You know, that's how I heard it sung. And I was like, well, I, I don't get that. And I, I refused to play that song. And of course, I got asked to, for it as a harpist until my, uh, my, a patron who was really changing my life, asked me to play the song. And I was like, oh, seriously, do I have to? But I found my own vocabulary with it. And I realized that to me, I had to understand what the story of the song was and what the song was about. And that allowed me to sing it in a very different way, that it's a song of a father just longing for having for his son who's gone. And this is a very... Oh, 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 Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. It's a very different song, but it took me, uh, it took me getting past a prejudice 
to be able of of what of how I had heard the song or something that I thought that song was in order to find my true voice with that song. And I think that happens all over our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's a physical thing, we think that the voice is supposed to sound a certain way or we think we're supposed to move a certain way or we think we're supposed to look a certain way. And to find our own voice that starts with who we are naturally instead of trying to fit into something else. Now, I'll bet you come up to that all the time. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, as you were talking, there were so many things going through my mind. And I was thinking instead of the word true true for voice, maybe a more accurate um, from from a perspective of analytical psychology is to say our our whole voice, our more expansive voice, our the larger voice. I mean, it's hard to find words that don't imply judgment mm, or better than. Mm. Because what I'm thinking is a true part of you was in all of the being of the harpist. I mean, I you clearly that is something connected deep inside of you, but it's only one one aspect. And that aspect, that voice, that energy is a part of the larger whole of who you are um, as a composer. And so in some ways, I think part of finding our true voice is recognizing the bit of truth that's in all of what we're doing, saying, and, and desiring and locating that in the larger. You so, know, it's the so funny essence. because when you said that, I was like, oh my God, that's the key to this. Um, I just uh, I just realized that I couldn't find myself in the harp. I, I at uh-huh. first, I, 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 I just, um, I, I was trying to be a good harpist. I was trying to be a harpist like anybody mm-hmm. else. And then eventually I discovered, I little by little by little kept coming closer and closer to myself. So like when I said, I am about stories and music. And as so the harp has to be a vehicle for that. It has to be a platform for that. It can't be me fitting into it. And as I got closer to clo- and closer to that in the harp, then I was able to make that transition and start bringing in the other part of me. And that's what I love to work with when I'm working with people in the academy is, it's okay, you've got this harp. Now, how does it become the catalyst? And honestly, Kathleen, until this moment, I've always said the platform, but now I'm thinking, how does that harp become the catalyst? And it could be a harp, it could be cooking, it could be dancing, it could be anything. How did it become the catalyst for your true voice? And I just realized as I sang Danny Boy that that specific song became a catalyst for my true voice. Right. Right. Yeah. So part of what I'm hearing you say is when you first started playing the harp, you tried to fit into the collective idealized persona of harpist, this role, and that way that, that you were working with the harp and teachers were teaching you or whatever, the uh, the persona didn't have nearly it, it was way too confining it was this tea tiny little box that left out the largesse of who you are and that over time you found a way to let the largesse of who you are come to the heart and the heart pulled the largesse of who you are out and 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 so that instead of being too small of a box it became a part of the, the lay of who you are, the lay of your larger psyche. And and I think that our larger psyche, we have to talk about that when we're going to talk about our true voice or our more complete voice. You know, I, I, just, I just want to invite, I know that we're, we're on this platform now, finally, again, where, where, <laughs> where we can, where we can see your comments. So if you are listening live and i know we didn't get out there and tell you in in advance but if you're listening live if you we would love to hear from you and are you have you experienced this are you in a situation with something where there's something that you love but it's boxing you in versus Mm -hmm. becoming the catalyst for your freedom and i think that's at the heart i sense of this is as we go for 
expanding and being creative and being expressive within any art form, I know that I just got boxed more into the harp. Like, can I play faster? Can I do this? You know, can I fit into that? And I see that many with many of the students in the academy, the members of the academy, they're like, I just need to be able to play faster. And I'm thinking, no, you don't need to be able to play faster. What I want you to be able to do is to play a single note and bring the rest of you there so that that single note becomes a catalyst or a reason for whatever, for not for whatever, a catalyst for you then expressing the fullness of you. And, and I'm going to say the trueness of you. And I'm only going to say true in the sense that, you know, what it means for something to be true is when it's hanging down. If something is true, it's balanced. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to compensate. Yeah, I, I sometimes think about things being in right alignment, but again, the word right can have negative connotations. It's kind of like the plum, isn't it? Yeah, the plumb line. Plum line. It's, 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 it's the plumb line. The is true, yeah. And, yeah, and so that in some ways, and from my perspective as an analyst, when I work with people, anything is a, can be a catalyst for us living into our fullness and finding our voice. Okay. The problem is that in all arenas of our life, we tend to shut down part of ourselves to fit into the collective persona, the idealized idea of what it should be. Instead of, okay, yeah, how do I play the harp? How do you play the harp? Not how's the harp supposed to be played? So how do we get that persona? And how can people like me or, or anybody who's you know, or coaching or out there in the public eye, how can we change that persona, open it up for people? I mean, I guess I've done that. I mean, I know I've seen that, that, right. that I've done that. And just by being me, and it took me a while to get out with the harp and not try to look like a harpist, but to allow <laughs> myself to look like basically what I, the childhood, you know, superhero I wanted to look like. <laughs> And, and that required, yeah. you know, getting a new heart, you know, sort of inventing a new instrument and stuff. But um, that was a long journey. But how how is it that we get caught in that persona? And how is it that we how is it that we see that we're yeah, that we what kind of personas do we get caught in? And what are a couple steps we can do to start opening up the possibilities of those personas? Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, totally mucking about but, yeah. Um, oh, and Deb, I'm so glad to see you're here today. That's great. Um, yeah, so one of the things I want to say from a psychological point of view is the persona's, per persona's not bad. The persona is the psychic structure that mediates between who we are and the outside world. The problem is when the persona is totally fueled by the ego's orientation to what we should be and how we should look and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So the way out is to start looking within, to start instead of thinking about, okay, what's the harpist I should be? Right. Or what is the therapist I'm supposed to be? Or what is the person, the woman I'm supposed to look like? And look within to say, okay, but what in me wants to find an expression here? What is it I feel deeply when I come to this role? What is it in me that wants to, to enter in here? You know, I was fortunate in that my first Jungian analyst was also a mas licensed massage therapist. She was certified in Traeger. Uh, she was studying Pilates. And she was not a traditional psychoanalyst where you just talked and, and that was it. I mean, she had a massage table. She integrated. Mm -hmm. That was her way of breaking out of that too small persona of what it meant to, to be and bring in all of what she felt and believed and knew was a part of healing. So, oh, I so I think, bringing it, yeah. Let me let me bring it, yeah. it to bear. Let me pull yeah. up Deb's comment. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the things I love about it is she's saying yes, totally mucking about with this myself. And I know that mucking, you know, is like going into the into the stalls with the manure and 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 messing it around <laughs> and finding your way. And I really love that Deb is saying finding my way rather than even making my way or creating something, but going mm. into that, going into the muck. 
that we have and finding our way, starting to find our way out. And I'd be curious what, and look at, she's got a horse there too. So she knows <laughs> about mucking. Um, and so I would love to know what, you know, what you're doing, Deb, to, um, to explore that, um, what you're finding in the muck there. Yeah, and muck is important because part of the reason people stay caught in their persona and they they keep living the way people have told them they should or trying to look like other the collective says you should, whether the collective is your family or it's your partner or it's, you know, the kind of archetypal image of whatever it is you are, then because they don't want to deal with the muck inside, the guilt, the shame, the insecurity, um, the all of the times that they've been told, oh, that's wrong, that's bad, what are you trying to do? You're not going to be successful at that. I think about DHC, your journey and your um, working to find a heart company and a, and a heart builder mm -hmm. who would have the vision to create the DHC light as an instrument you could play. And now other people, I mean, Comac sells it. it it's, right. it's in their line. And you had the courage to go for what you want, even when people around you were probably saying things like, well, that's crazy or that's never going to work. Or they were just looking at you with a scowl. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, well, Maybe everybody met with it with, yeah, let's no, do it. No, no. <laughs> I mean, nobody, no, I don't think anybody said, well, some people said, that's stupid. Why don't you just play the guitar? If you want to play the guitar, why make a new harp? But, 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 um, it, so here's one thing that was really lucky for me in that. I, I mean, it's not that, I mean, anybody else could do this, I guess. And I was able to do it once in my life and I don't know if I could do it again. I, I, even though I came, came to the, when I came to the harp, I was like, the harp will save me from being myself and I will become a good <laughs> harpist. And then I will be a real person, a real musician. Um, and then I realized I really wasn't up to that. I, I still can't read and write mm. well. It's just not my thing. And, um, but what was beautiful was that there was always this persona on the side, but really, I write musical theater really, I'm the composer of the golden cage. That's who I really am. And it gave me freedom to, to play around with being a harpist mm -hmm. and to play around. And I remember the first time I went into a jazz, I mean, I wanted to learn jazz because I got, I would get, I kept getting stuck. You know, I got stuck in classical music and then I got stuck in this and I got stuck in that. And I kept looking for freedom. But I do remember the first time I decided I'm going to wear leggings and a mini skirt and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try to look like I wanted to look like Tina Turner <laughs> and and I and, and I even though I felt you know I I never had felt good about my body and I was like yeah but you know what I'll bet some other women don't feel that great about their bodies mm -hmm. and if I go out there and like this they're going to be like yeah I can do that too and so and I honestly I did it as a joke I was like I was it was mm -hmm. almost like a Halloween costume I can dress like this but that was actually, that gave me freedom and nobody laughed. They were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And the funny thing is Corky Hale, um, who's this amazing jazz harp player who I studied with, the first thing she said to me when I came to work with her and I knew I wanted to learn jazz from her, is she said, the first thing is you have to change the way you look. You have to walk out looking different. Huh. Now, as I'm saying this now, I mean, she was saying, you need to tell the audience that you're going to be doing something different, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting because Marvin Hamlet said to me, you have to walk out there and meet the audience where they think a harpist is and then bring them. So, And I think these are both true. But mm -hmm. the big thing I think about what Corky said to me was that it had more to do with me with me dressing differently so I can see myself differently. And it just occurred to me that the things that we see, whether it's our clothing or otherwise, is one of the first things we can do to start exploring a different way we might be with what we're doing. And I, I, I'm yeah. seeing, so I'm going to just pull Debs up. Yeah. I haven't read it yet, but it says exactly how to combine all the bits of self yeah. I like. And, and Deb, this is the thing for, this is my this is what I love to do in hip harp academy. This is what I love because it's what I love to see. It's it, I love to see how can you take that harp, use it as um, or whatever instrument. It doesn't really matter. It can be a show. It can be a I don't know, and then take that 
and use it to to become this the um the, the magnetic, the thing in the center that holds everything together so that you keep bringing more and more and more and more and more of you to it. And I just find it just so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It made me think about um, Winnicott, who was a psychoanalyst, his idea of transitional objects, that a transitional oh. object is something in the outside world that actually carries the projection of our larger self that thus pulls us to embody more of, of who we truly are. And there can be transitional phenomena as well as transitional well, objects. And well, um, okay, so what the trend? <laughs> so, uh, as you said that, I was like, oh my God, the harp was a transitional it's object. It's a transitional <laughs> object. If, even though it wasn't my, it's not like I saw a harpist and I want, and that's not actually, yeah. no, never mind. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, often we have transitional objects and growing up, we have them all the time. The security blanket for a little kid is a, a transitional oh. object, but we need transitional objects all our life. As adults, we tend to call, talk about them as symbols or sacred objects, or I love magical talismans, you know, <laughs> um, but, but there's some object that somehow energetically pulls us to live more of who we are and the key here is living it and acting on it i mean you know when you and what corky hell was saying is you've got to act on this part of you that wants to come into expression so if you walk out on stage looking different whether the look is your posture your attitude the you know the the sway of your movement or your outfit or the harp you're playing, then that conveys something different. And the other guy, Arthur, was also right, right? It was Arthur. <laughs> Who's he Arthur? wasn't that said the other thing. I forgot his name. You told me. I can't remember what the other thing was. You have to meet the audience for looking oh, like. Oh, oh, Marvin Hamlet. Marvin. Um, sorry, yeah. sorry, Marvin. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it just went out. Yeah. Um, it's also true that if you were going to meet them as a different kind of harpist, you clearly had to go out with a harp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So you, there had to be enough of the right. persona, of the collective expectation, that they would then be open to engaging you and let right. and, and going with you into another experience. Well, and he was also he was also saying, you know, you're you're performing in a concert hall. You're a, a concert soloist, and you have a harp. So already they're coming, even no matter what the PR says, they're coming with a certain expectation. So instead of you know starting off like um, you know like he says like you know start off like. Now they know you can play. They know it's a harp, right. and then, yeah. <laughs> and then you can go to that. But there's that that there's that transition of understanding with the uh, the audience. But I think this is something you know. My whole life, I grew up with these opera singers who were always fitting into roles, but they didn't fit. And and so I heard from the very beginning they weren't fitting into these roles, but they loved these roles and they would bring them alive for me. So I was the entire audience. They would put on, you know, a rec recording of the orchestra and they would stand there and boom, the whole thing would come alive. But they'd go to an audition and they wouldn't get the part because they were too big or they were blood or whatever, whatever who knows. And that really impacted me as a creator. As a child, I was like, no, never, no, I'm not fitting in. I will make my own thing. I will have the power to make my own thing. That didn't, but, but yeah, I still get stuck trying to fit in. I want to look this way or, you know. Well, and again, I, I want to, I want to say from a, from a psychological point of view, there's nothing wrong with that desire. Where it becomes problematic is when fitting in means we have to shut down who we are. We have mm -hmm. to disconnect from those bits mm -hmm. of ourself that we want to express. That's when it's problematic. I mean, we do live in a world with other people and collective expectations. And, you know, you and I are here this morning looking like the prof professionals and the women we are. And if we showed up in swimsuits, that might not be really, <laughs> uh, that would give a totally different vibe to our uh, what we're doing, our podcast and the video series. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not that 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 these things all are like 
horrible, terrible things. It's just a matter of saying, okay, what piece of this still can I stay true to my larger self? And if we're in a situation where we can't, where to fit into that persona or that role, we have to abdicate over half of who we are, in my opinion, too much of who we are, then that's probably not a healthy place for us to be. And I think that's the other thing we have to remember is that every, you know, we have to be grounded in reality and look at, is this a place that's that's big enough for me? And maybe, and sometimes we are able and collective movements help places get bigger. They help, I mean, clearly right. with the golden cage and you're opening up both um, characters to all genders, you were making that bigger. You were saying that the story is what's important mm -hmm. here. It's not the gender of the characters. Right, or the age And you the opened up anything. auditions yeah. to, to all. And so sometimes we can work within established systems, boxes, personas, and help them expand collectively. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, <laughs> is this mine? Is this mine in this lifetime? Is this the best? Is this the highest use of my energy? Is this the use of my energy that's going to be the most effective? That's it's interesting, and and I I'm as as you're saying this, I'm just thinking again about Hip Hop Academy because this is this is exactly what I do, and I mm -hmm. do it with the thought that I, I actually take that I, I, with the thought that this is this is what someone's chosen, and with the belief that even if they had only one finger and that was it, that was all they had, one finger, that the harp could still I mean anything could be, but it's just that I know the harp, the harp. It, almost anything can be the um, catalyst for self-expression if, and this is what I think is so interesting and what I'd love to talk to you more about, if we are not trying to fit into a preconceived notion and yet at the same time using, using um, archetypes from our past really helps. I mean, I list, the one record I listened to as a child was Word Jazz by Ken Nordine. And that got me into the, the you know, the like, the whole idea that we can talk. We can talk with music. And music can give the background of the talk and it can talk with us. You know, so, so yeah. that, you know, that combined with superhero combined with you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, Peter and the Wolf, you know, well, that became um, an archetype or, or, or a persona that opened things up for me. And so I think that, and this is why I think we often need a coach to help us open that up because we get stuck. And I certainly did. And my coaches have made it possible for me to open up to a completely new idea and working with other people, this is, I mean, my model was working with Tony Montanaro, who was a mime, but he spoke and he didn't wear white face and we worked in groups and we, and, and so that's what I pretty much created in the academy, a situation where there are many people looking at this, you get to see how other people are doing it, you get to open it up, you have a coach who's pushing the boundaries with you. Yeah, definitely having a coach or a mentor, you're having a therapist or an analyst mm -hmm. when it comes to your personal um, life is extremely helpful because we don't know what we don't know. You know, when we're in the box, we're caught in the persona, we don't we don't see what's outside, but someone else can see what's outside. One of my major training analysts used to say, the unconscious is the unconscious. It means it's unknown. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I don't know what's in my unconscious, but you can see something in me that you could then lead me to see, vice versa. And the same, I think, is true about the heart. I want to just say this real quick, and then if, if you want to pull up Deb's other comment. Sure. Um, I remember going early on when I started playing the heart, I went to a, work, a workshop by a very well-known harpist, whom I, I will not name, and um, she was teaching these left-hand patterns, and it was very early on for me, and I was really struggling 
to do the left hand with the right hand. And she made this comment, which of course I took as about me. Now that's my stuff right now. But she said, you know, some people just aren't cut out to play the harp if you can't play both hands at the same what? time. What? Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and so when I hear you say, if you can just with one finger and listen to the beauty, I, that's just an example of a persona of a harpist. I can remember another harp teacher saying there are a lot of one-handed harpists out there. Of course, she said it in a derogatory tone. Yeah. And so that boxed-in persona is so different than you're saying if you can play one note. And then another note. Yeah, or and if you have a, one finger, the harp is the best instrument. Yeah. If you have only one finger, you can do so. I mean... Yeah, so I think there again is, is an example of a box, a persona right. fitting into an ideal that's way too small and hurtful. The need for someone in your voice to say, okay, but there's many ways to play the harp. There are many expressions that are beautiful and valuable and valid and effective. Yeah, when you, when and, you bring your whole self, not if you're trying to be this kind of harpist. Right. But I mean, if That's you right. are bringing, if you are bringing everything you are, if you're dancing, if you're whatever you can do, right. it, it, the harp just becomes that catalyst. Right. It becomes the thing that, that opens it, that opens it up. Um, here, yeah. and we're, you asked me to bring Debs up, but I know, and we're, we're talking faster because we know we have to get off <laughs> like two minutes ago. But Deb is saying, timely, working on how I can connect with my target audience on their level while expressing and exploring exploring my interests and talents and what i what i love about this is um there are so many levels and none of them are below or above they're kind of like different um and so there's there's opportunity and there's possibility and this is again one of the things i love about the academy that i'm working always with people on multiple technical levels it's not like the people at a quote, higher technical level are going to show the people at a lower technical level. <laughs> it's often the other way around that people who have less, are less um, uh, formulated into um, a specific technique can open up possibilities and ideas for everybody. And so, and, and that's why this whole thing of, of working on different levels, I just find absolutely um, exhilarating and, and exciting. And, what, and, it, and it opens up expressing our own interests. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and for me, it is seeing the thread, you know, it's like looking at the thread of the, my interest and talent mm -hmm. that it's like, Where's the root for that person? Mm. Because it is true when we're working with people, whether we're coaching them as harpist or um, we're working as a therapist of some sort, or we're working with the horses like Deb works. I happen to know she works with horses as well as people um, that, you know, we have to be able to meet them where they are and respond to where they are. So I know a point of growth for me over the last couple of years since I started the online embodiment circles is how do I break down this very complex thoughts and ideas that are very abstract into very experienceable digestive bits that people can build on experientially. And I think that, you know, so for me, it's been an opportunity and I've benefited so much. And I hear how the people who are um, in the fourth spiral now, they, the benefit is building. Right. And so I think also thinking about it as that building process. We didn't, our understanding in relationship to where we are now mm -hmm. didn't start there. It started somewhere else. And I think that um, that helps me be able to find my true voice, even when I'm going back to what to me may now feel like preschool uh, but that's okay. because you know everything we ever needed to know we learned in kindergarten right right, right. <laughs> and and i just want to say um i know we have to go and 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 i just want to say that this all gets grown in conversation 
And this yes. is a conversation. And I just want to thank you, Kathleen and Deb and everybody else who's been watching this and who will watch it afterwards for being part of this conversation where we are exploring mm -hmm. ideas. And um, and Reham is saying, much respect to your inclusive and empowering approach to playing the harp. Welcome back, ladies. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Deb. Thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward um, to seeing you all again next week. Hope I, we were able to use this platform again. I'm so excited. I'm hoping it's going to work. Okay, Kathleen, thank you so much. And I'll see you again next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay,